<laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started today. Um, so uh, today is going to be one of the more, uh, I'll say important. I think we've got some people rolling. Come on in, Wesley. All right. It's okay. We're a little thin today. There, Brother Corn's teaching the step competition. It's okay. Um, so, uh, what we're going to do today, my plan for today, was uh, the last uh, seven or eight weeks we've been talking about uh, Bible versions, the King James Bible, and so on and so forth. And so, today is going to be the last lesson on that. And I, what I want to do today is, so we've thrown all the puzzle pieces out on the table. You know, we've talked about the different things with the history of the Bible and comparing them and the old language and some of the manuscript and historical things. What we're going to do today is we're going to take all those pieces and put them together. So my intention for today is that um, for today you can look back and, you know, if, if you ever question, you know, why are we King James? Um, then you can look back at this lesson, and I'll just tell you, uh, if you don't know why after today, then I don't know what to do with you. So um, uh, today is going to be uh, pretty burdened with today, and um, so th that is that. My intention is to present the, the lesson today in a way that uh, I'm, if I was assuming the audience had no prior knowledge and was completely unbiased. Now, obviously, we've had eight weeks of prior knowledge. So when I present this, um, just keep that uh, into consideration, all right? And so what I'm, we're going to talk about today is the, what I call the two paradigms of Bible translations. Uh, really, there is not one Bible, um, but there's also not five, six, ten, hundreds of Bibles. There's two Bibles. Uh, there's two and there's two paradigms of the Bible, Bible translations, and the history of how we got the Bible. And we're going to talk about those two paradigms today. But first, let's lay a scriptural foundation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So from the very beginning, we see there is power in the Word of God. There is authority in the Word of God. Exodus 24, 4, and Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. So now we know that God's Word is powerful, it's authoritative, and now we're saying God's words are being written down. Okay, we call that Scripture, the written Word of God. Uh, a beautiful example of this is in Jeremiah 36, verse 2. God says to Jeremiah, Take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee. Again, the, the written word of God. Uh, Joshua 1, 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt... Uh, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Psalm, I, I was thinking about singing it. I was, I was getting there. Yeah. Uh, Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and, pra and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 17.17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Revelation 19.11, and I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with, clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horse, clothed in fine linen, fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, um, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule with them a rod of iron. And he treadeth the, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he doth on his vesture and on high a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 22:18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. It seems to me God really cares about his word. He is the living word, and he did promise to preserve the written word. Psalm 118.89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm chapter 12 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. forever. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the following statement that Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 5.18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So God does care about his word. He does care about his written word. He promised to preserve his word, his written word. And uh, it is clear, based upon the authority of Scripture, that the enemy attacks and corrupts the Word of God. Second, uh, Second Corinthians 11.3 But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so God will, uh, the enemy will corrupt his word subtly. Through his subtly, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Remember what the serpent said. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 tells us, And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Yea, hath, hath God said, Ye shall eat of the tree of the garden, and he said unto the woman, Yea, God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And so he, uh, Satan's devices is to get you to question exactly what did God say. Yea, hath God said, subtly, subtly. Jeremiah 36, 23. Jeremiah wrote down those words that God told him to write down, and he did present them uh, to, to uh, the king. Uh, that when King Je that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the earth until all the roll was consumed and the fire that was on the hearth. Um, and so, and he did that until all of the book that Jeremiah gave him was consumed. The world hates God's words. When the world hears God's words and they don't like it, they want to change it or they want to destroy it. Luke chapter four. Uh, verse 9, And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, This is Satan, uh, speaking to Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written. So here's Satan quoting the written word. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Even in Paul's day there were people corrupting the word of God. Second Peter chapter 1, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent gl glory. That is, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. 
And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And then verse 1 of the very next chapter, so the very next thing Peter says, he says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So the enemy is attacking the word of God. The enemy is corrupting the word of God. What do we do about it? What are, what are we supposed to, what, what is our attitude supposed to be towards this corruption? Deuteronomy chapter 18 tells us that if that, uh, God is instructing the people on how to discern who is a prophet. He said, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? And he says, when a, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, this is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So here the Lord is instructing the people on how to discern what is my word and what is false. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul writes, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received uh, it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh all things in you that believe. John 16.13 says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever he shall hear, uh, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Paul charged Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. He says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babbling, babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Now that word science in the Greek is gnosis. That's where we get the word Gnostic from. If something is Gnostic, they claim to have a higher knowledge, a higher understanding than God. Uh, and so Paul is simply saying, reject these people that claim to have a higher knowledge, a higher understanding of God than that which is in the Scripture. Okay, so what is the charge to Christians? It is we are to discern what is and what is not the Word of God. And what is our litmus test? I remind you from week three the things that we said the word of God will always be this. It's actually right there. The word of God will always be this. It will be infallible and inerrant. It will be a tool that can be utilized in defending the faith. Um, it is for and kept by the church. And it is incorruptible. All right? Infallible and inerrant. The Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written... Uh, Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. God is not a man that he should lie. God cannot lie. He is incapable of lying. Uh, so the word of God will not have corruptions. It will not have errors. It will not have lies. God is incapable of lying. It is a tool that is to be utilized in defending the faith. Every response that Jesus gave to the enemy when the enemy tempted him, he began by saying, it is written. It is written. There is authority in the scripture. We can use the scripture to defend what we believe. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is, to be, it is for and to be kept by the church. In Deuteronomy 31, we read how God would charge his people to gather every seven years to hear the reading of the law. All of his people. It is to be kept by his people, to be kept by the scribes and the Levites, and it is to be for all people. 
All of God's people. Colossians 4.16, when, when at the end of uh, uh, Paul's epistle to the Colossians, he said, cause that it be read also to the church of the Laodiceans, that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. He told the church in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The Bible is for the church. It is to be kept by the church. The church is the custodian of the Bible. So when we look throughout history and we look at where the Bible, where, where are God's people? Where are their Bible believers? That's where the Bible is. It's not academia. It's not heretics. It's not false religions. It, 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 it's not college professors. It's where is the church? That is where the Word of God will be. Finally, the Word of God is incorruptible. You see, uh, Jesus said, if he called them gods, in John 10, 35, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture cannot be broken. Another one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And Peter goes on to say that, uh, that the, the, the flower withereth and falleth thereof, but the word of God is from everlasting to everlasting. That's how we identify the word of God. So what are the paradigms of Bible translations? I've got 30 minutes left. Let's talk about this. Number one, I want to talk about the paradigm of the King James Bible and how we got it from the traditional text. And number two, I want to talk about the paradigm of modern versions and how they came from what we call the critical text. Number one, the paradigm of the manuscripts. How are the object, what are, what are the objective manuscript facts? We just step back, look at the manuscripts, what are some objective facts? First of all, the traditional text is supported, the traditional text that we derive our King James Bible from, is supported by 99% of extant Greek manuscripts, of existing Greek manuscripts, 99%. It has overwhelming early church fathers' support. You realize in the first, second, third, and fourth centuries, we have 84,000 early church father quotations, okay, in the first four centuries overwhelming, the overwhelming evidence of the church father quotations come from the traditional text. We have overwhelming early translational evidence. So not just Greek manuscripts, but what was translated into Latin, into Syriac, into Coptic, into all these other languages. Overwhelming support for the traditional text. It has been used by the church throughout the centuries used by the church throughout the centuries. It encompasses a wide geographic location. So within the traditional text, we know there are multiple streams of transmission, multiple different lines of transmission. Some will say that the fuller reading of the, of the traditional text that was added in by scribes. Well, the fact of the matter is that within this body of 5,800 manuscripts, there are multiple streams of transmission. How did 20 different scribes and multiple locations correspond to add in the fuller reading that is now in our Bible? I don't think so. It can be traced back to historically and translationally to, to Antioch, which is important. Antioch was the first established church in the Bible. It would be from Antioch that Paul would go forth from his, uh, missionary, his first missionary journey. Antioch was the first missionary sending church. And vitally importantly, it is internally cohesive. It's harmonious. It's not full of contradictions. Uh, uh, there's a consistency within the text. That is the objective uh, manuscript facts about the traditional text. What are the objective manuscript facts about the critical text? Less than 1%. Less than 1% of all existing Greek manuscripts are in the critical text that the modern versions are derived from. They were, and throughout history, they have been buried in the sands of Egypt or locked away in the Vatican, not being used by the church. 
there is virtually no early translational support. Latin, Coptic, Syriac, virtually no other translational support. Uh, very, very little early church father support. And what early church father support there is is almost overwhelmingly from Egypt. It's almost overwhelmingly church fathers who are writing who were part of the church at Egypt. Again, an isolated geographic area. Virtually all of the critical text comes from Egypt. Not the entire Mediterranean world like the, um, like the traditional text. All from Egypt. That should cause us to ask questions. And even further, more specifically, they are, and even modern scholars are, are, would tell you this, their origin is Alexandria. So we have an origin of Antioch and an origin of Alexandria. We're going to talk about why that's important. And within the critical text, it is not internally cohesive. The question is, aren't, isn't that 1%? Shouldn't we rely upon them because they are older manuscripts? Well, under that presupposition, if the older the manuscript, the less variances there will be, the more cohesive the text will be. But that's not true. As a matter of fact, the critical text, that is the oldest text, is less cohesive. It's got more variances, many of which are important scripturally. Solomon did write that in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. In the multitude of counsel, there is safety. So that is the objective manuscript facts about the, fa about the text. But number two, historicity. What are the objective historical facts about the text? The traditional text was carried by the church in the Byzantine Empire and by the Bible believers in the Roman Catholic Empire. So in the Roman Catholic Empire, the Roman Catholic Church brutally uh, uh, persecuted groups like the Waldensians and the Albigensians, if you do a, a historical study. What manuscripts did these, ch the, the, these northern Italy churches use that defied the Church of Rome? Traditional text manuscripts. Isn't that interesting? It was used by God to bring about the Protestant reformations. All the reformers used the traditional text. Why? Because the Alexandrian text was buried in the sands of Egypt. No one was using it at that time. They all used the traditional text. And then specifically with our King James Bible, uh, I, I, would, I would submit to you based on any historical uh, any historical study whatsoever that this is a book that unites nations. This is the book that made America. This book. This one. Uh, many people say about Shakespeare that um, England made Shakespeare. But the King James Bible made England. This is a book that unites nations. Uh, second, and and I, I don't talk a lot about this. I haven't so far. But the, the fact of the matter is that God has used this book more than any other book in human history. And I'm not just really talking about the Bible. I'm talking about this Bible. Uh, he has used this book in the Great Awakening under the preaching of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, under the preaching of Finney, under the preaching of Spurgeon, Moody, Billy Sunday. Whether you like him or not, Billy Graham preached out of this book. All right? Uh, it is, uh, he was no means a King James onlyist, but when you look at where he was the most doctrinally sound early on in his ministry, he was King James only, uh, and he always preached out of this book. It is true that, that there has been and still is more missionary work done by missionaries sent with King James Bible than any other translation. Okay, compare that historical paradigm to the historical paradigm of the critical text. The critical text, as I said, it has its origins in Alexandria. In Alexandria, Egypt in the time, there was, a, there was what we call the great school of Alexandria. Okay, so this is a school of Alexandria. It was really the first liberal arts seminary, uh, really, in the history of Christianity. Not really a good thing, and, uh, in my opinion. What do we know about this school of Alexandria? It was full of Gnostic people that thought to have a higher knowledge than what the scripture says, full of Gnostic and heretical thinking. It was ecumenical. 
What does ecumenical mean? It means we're going to welcome all trains of thought. We're going to welcome anybody and anybody that thinks they know what, what, you know the truth about the Bible. We're not going to draw any hard lines. All are welcome to come. Okay, if you think you, you, you know, you know, if you think you have this higher knowledge of the scripture than what the scripture says, come on over, you're welcome. Ecumenical, all are welcome. Uh, what else do we know about this Gnostic uh, kind of thinking? Um, they were adoptionists, okay? They literally believed that God adopted Christ, okay? That Christ was not begotten of God. That Christ was not God, but that God adopted Christ. In other words, he was a created being and was subordinate to God. Completely contrary to what Christ said. He said, I and the Father are one. What else do we know? Acts chapter 6, verse 9. The only time the Alexandrians are mentioned in your Bible is in Acts chapter 6, verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Syrians and Alexandrians. And of them of uh, Sicilia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. So the only time in your Bible where we hear about the Alexandrians, they are arguing with Stephen. And this is the same chapter in which they then deliver Stephen to the council, and then which leads to him being stoned. Okay, the Alexandrians. Every reference to Egypt in the Bible is bad. Every single one. Excuse me if I don't want a Bible that originates from Egypt. All right. I'm just trying to use the Bible to apply the Bible. We must understand the modern theory of textual criticism of the critical text. They would tell you that the words of God were lost around the third century. That they were buried in a monastery in Mount Sinai in Egypt. Or they were buried in, in clay jars in the sands of Egypt. And that this, under this theory the words of God were lost. And we have now, in the, eight, in the middle of the 1800s, started digging them up out of the sands. And so now we can have the Word of God. The problem is it's completely contrary to what the Bible says about itself. That every generation will have the Word of God. They will tell you that there was no complete Bible based upon the critical text until 1881 in any language. What else do we know? The critical text has brought about no revivals ever, none, period. None. None. The critical Bibles are, the critical text and the modern Bibles are admittedly, you can read the preface and they'll tell you this. They are designed to be ecumenical. Uh, my, my dad, he, he has an NIV Bible on a shelf. That's what he was given when he was baptized back in the 80s. And I opened it up the other day. And, and in that very, it listed all the denominational, all the denominations that stamped their approval on this book. You know, every single one of them, from Catholic to, to Baptist, and everything in between. Uh, can I tell you, I don't want an ecumenical Bible. I don't care what Pastor Lisa at the United Methodist Church has to say about the Bible. I just don't. I don't care what Cardinal uh, Carlo Maria Martini, who was a Jesuit cardinal that translated the that, that helped construct the text that is based on that the modern Bibles are based on. I don't care what he has to say about the Bible because he's not a Bible believer. I'm not saying that to be closed minded or narrow minded or or, or, or or to reject their scholarship. I'm saying because the Bible itself will tell you that this book is for the church of God for people that believe it and ought to be transmitted by people that believe in it. I'm saying it on scriptural authority, not on my view of how people ought to translate. What else do we know? Uh, A and B, or Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, the two pillars of the modern textual, the modern critical text, says, uh, or has been the, 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 uh, the manuscripts of choice of every single liberal scholar in the 1800s. Now, what about the papyri, Brother Andy? You know, we have all these papyri that are older, and they, ver they verify these readings, and, uh, you know, we have such a rich amount of papyri. Well, let me tell you about the papyri. So what happened is Sinaiticus came along in the 1850s, Remember Westcott and Hort? They used Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, which was locked away in the Vatican Library, to construct the first Greek text um, that would be used for modern Bible translation. 
And then in the late 1800s, the 1890s, the early 1900s, they started digging up these papyri out of the sands of Egypt. The, the largest excavation of papyri is in what's called Oxyrhynchus, Egypt. The Oxyrhynchus papyri. Um, if you go and you read and you find that this, these papyri that they're digging up and that are now being used to translate Bibles with were literally dug up in the same pile of rubbish that they found copies of the Gospel of Thomas, copies of the Gospel of Mary, copy of the Gospel of Peter, which even modern scholars will tell you we should reject. We should not consider them to be canonical. We talked about that in week two. But yet, even though we should reject those, we should take the scriptures of the Bible that we dig up right next to them and use those for Bible translation. I'm sure they weren't tampered with at all. This is what they say, okay? Now, the second largest excavation was what we call the Chester Beatty papyri. They were found in a region called Nag Hammadi. Do a Google search of Nag Hammadi in Egypt. Um, it, is this, it is this is where the Nag Hammadi library was discovered, um, which has the largest, the single largest collection of Gnostic writings of people that are heretics ever is in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, including over 50, 50 Gnostic Gospels. This is the same area we found the Chester Beatty papyri that is now being used for Bible translation. And I have no shame in saying I think that is absolutely asinine, crazy, absurd. Crazy. Crazy. All right. This is the basis of modern Bible translations. All right. Number three, the paradigm of the men. What are the objective facts about the men who constructed and translated the text? The objective facts. The traditional checks, text, as I've mentioned, was used by the church throughout the ages. I could give you a list of hundreds of early church fathers in the first four centuries that used the text. As I mentioned, the Albigensian and Waldensians that were heavily persecuted by the Roman church carried the traditional text. John Wycliffe, who translated the very first Bible out of Latin, used the traditional text. He's one of my heroes. See, he died, and then posthumously, uh, the Catholic Church anathematized him and excommunicated him, excommunicated him from their church. They actually dug up his bones and burned them. My hero, all right? I want, to, I want the Bible that that guy carries. All of the reformers carry the traditional text. The 95 theses that were nailed to the door at the church of Wittenberg, Germany, uh, Luther used the traditional text to refute the doctrines of Rome. Sola Scriptura was their cry. Scripture alone, not Scripture and the Pope, not Pope over the Scripture, Scripture alone. I want the Bible that those men had. William Tyndale, my actual hero, uh, who translated the Bible that would the first English Bible from the from the Textus Greek Textus Receptus Greek text, um, which would be the precursor to the King James Bible. In fact, he completed all of the New Testament, um, some of the first books of the law, and the Book of Jonah before they burned him at the stake for copying the Bible, for translating the Bible into the English language. They burned him at the stake for doing that. His dying wish was, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And that's exactly what happened. And I hold in my hand a King James Bible. All right. The 54 men of Hampton Court that translated the King James Bible was, verify me on this, look this up. It was the greatest assembly of Bible translation work in human history. Greatest in what ways? Greatest in scholarship, but more importantly, greatest in spirit-led. These men were men that wanted to please the Lord. Look up what they believed. Look up their biographies. These, these were men of the church. They were pastors. They were evangelists. At that day, if you were in academia, you were a man of the church. Very small period in time where that was the case. All right? What about the men of the critical text? Well, we know that the critical text, uh, again, has its origins in Alexandria, Egypt, where uh, Arius was in the 4th century. And then there's a great controversy in the early church about Arianism. 
He did not believe that Jesus was God, but was a creature created by God the Father. Other men like Eusebius, who would come after him, uh, who was a, one, of the, one of the greatest in terms of amount at that time, one of the greatest Bible translators and constructors of, of Greek texts in that time. In fact, after Christianity became legal, it would be the Roman emperor who would ask Eusebius to translate 50 Bibles for the Roman Empire. This guy was an Arian in Alexandria, Egypt. He was actually the pastor of the church in Egypt. And he did not believe that Christ was God. Just food for thought. Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort, 1880s. They came along and they took Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. What did they believe? Let me remind you. Westcott, I reject the infallibility of the Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. Our Bible as well as our faith is a mere compromise. He said, hell is not a place of punishment for, of the guilty. It is the common abode of departed spirits. The popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Nothing, nothing can be more unscriptural than the limiting of Christ bearing our sins and suffering to his death. Nothing can be more unscriptural than the fact that Christ died for my sins. That's what Westcott believes. He said, no one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. He said, I never read the account of a miracle, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability. I don't believe it's possible. He said, the battle of inspiration of the scriptures has yet to be fought, and oh, how earnestly I pray that I might aid in causing the church to be divided about whether the fact that the Bible is inspired or not. That's what Westcott believed. By the way, all of those quotations are taken from uh, two volumes called The Life and Letters of Westcott uh, by his son, Arthur. Those are his writings, what he put ink to paper. That's not me taking something out of context. That's not me reading what a biographer said. Those are his writings, what he wrote on paper. What did Hort believe? He said, I have been persuaded that many, for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common. He said, quote, but the book that engages me is Darwin. Uh, whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. At present, my feeling is strong that the theory, the theory of evolution, is unanswerable. And then he said, the positive doctrines uh, of the evangelicals seem to be perverting rather than untrue. He said, basically, the, the doctrines of the faith are perverted and they're not true. There are, I feel, still more serious differences between us, meaning him and and the evangelicals of the day on the subjects of authority and especially the authority of the Bible. So the doctrine of evolution is unanswerable. But the authority of Scripture, uh, that's shaky. All right? I'm not so sure about that. That's what Hort believed. That's the root. By the way, no good fruit can come from a corrupt root. Did you hear what I said? No good fruit can come from a corrupt root root. Okay, what about the lexicons that modern translators use? Okay, so a lexicon is where we take a Greek word and we figure out what is the English equivalent. The first guy to use a, to, to create a lexicon um, back in the 1800s that would be used for, for Bible translation was a guy by the name of J. Henry Thier, Thayer. He was Harvard educated, so he must be the most brilliant guy ever. He was a Unitarian not a Bible believer, and not doctrinally sound. Even to this day, if you, have you heard of Blue Letter Bible? You can get on the, the internet and, and compare different things and Greek translations and so on and so forth. Even Blue Letter Bible would state this about his lexicon. They have a caution warning. They say, according to Baker's modern copyright edition, Thayer was apparently not doctrinally sound in all areas. I love how they said that. In all areas. Particularly in the area of the Trinity, and so the user must be on guard. Uh, we would, and then they, they say we would appreciate if any actual examples of doctrine and error uh, would be provided so that we can give uh, uh, caution tags for the reader. Gerhard Kittel, I talked about Gerhard Kittel. He was uh, Adolf Hitler's high priest. He edited, this is the same guy that wrote the theological foundation for Hitler to persecute six million Jews. He edited the lexicons that are being used in modern Bible translation. That's a fact. Look it up, people. All right. I better, uh, I better keep rolling. Men like Eberhard Nessel would come along. 
they would develop a Greek text based on Westcott and Hort and some of these other manuscripts. A man by the name of Kurtalon would then edit his text and then the most, the most popular Greek text used as the basis for modern Bibles today is called the Nessel Alond Greek text. Its root is the Westcott and Hort Greek text, taking into account some of these other papyri that they found. He said, and I've got a whole page of, of, of um, uh, basically, Kurt Alond, um, did not believe in the veracity of the scripture. He did not believe that Moses literally wrote the books of the law. Um, he, he was an extreme ecumenist. He actually had two, uh, two audiences with the Pope presenting him this new ecumenical Bible that the Catholic Church and the Protestants are now united on. He was very proud of it. Bruce Metzger would come along. Bruce Metzger is, you ask any modern critical scholar today, Bruce Metzger has his fingertips on every single modern translation of the Bible ever. Okay, what did he believe? He did not believe that Moses literally wrote the books of the law. Uh, he did not believe that many of the writers, like Peter, James, Paul, Moses, that they weren't the actual authors of these books. Um, he has a whole host of people that studied under him who are now uh, actually agnostic Bible critics, one of the most famous being Bart Ehrman, who is now the head of the theology department at uh, UNC Chapel Hill who stands in front of the thousands of students every single year telling them that God is not true and we don't have the text of the Bible because of what he stuttered under Bruce Metzger. Okay, so on and so forth. I could keep going. Where are we at on modern scholars today? The guys that are doing the work today, constructing the text, doing the translation. James, or excuse me. Uh, well, there's a scholar named James White. Uh, he goes around debating King James only as he, he, he's got a big ego. Um, and, uh, but he is very smart. I like to listen to him when he's just giving a lecture, but when he debates people, he, he, he's not very nice and he makes them feel really dumb. But he said, quote, 80% of all Old Testament scholars don't believe in Mosaic authority, authorship. Don't believe in Mosaic authorship. 80% of all Old Testament scholars today don't believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. When that's what they say, that's what Joshua says, that's what Jesus himself said. All right? Think about that. Do we have Bible believers doing Bible translation work today? 80% of them apparently don't. They're men of academia. All right? So on and so forth. What else do we know? But, Brother Andy, are there actual differences? Like, really? Aren't they just the same, only worded a little differently? Aren't they? Well, you, you tell me. In Ephesians 3, 9, it uh, says, And to make all men see that what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. The phrase by Jesus Christ is completely removed from modern translations. 1 Timothy 3, 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You know what the New Bible say? He who was manifest in the flesh. Not God was manifest in the flesh. I'm going somewhere with this. 1 John 4, 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. The modern Bible say every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus has come in the flesh. Not Jesus Christ, Jesus. And I could go on and on. Matthew 16, 20. Uh, Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It just says, believe in the Lord Jesus. Um... You say, Andy, you're being pretty nitpicky there. Separating Jesus from Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, that's exactly what I thought when someone first told me. That's kind of nitpicky. I mean, it's still the same guy, Christ and Jesus. You're right, that is nitpicky. But it doesn't happen once or twice, or five times, or ten times, or thirty times, or sixty times, or seventy times. 86 times in the critical text, there is a severance between Jesus and Christ or Jesus and Lord. 86 times. The Gnostics didn't believe that he was Lord. 86 times. Folks, here's what I know. There's a lot of smoke with the critical text. And usually where there's smoke, there's a fire. 86 times. In light of the fact that they have stripped away the doctrinal support for the fact that he was born of a virgin, 
They had completely removed 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. They've taken out that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last in Revelation 1, 11. They've changed, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God in Philippians 2, 6, with the, he thought it not something to be grasped, whatever that means. He said um, so on and so forth, all right? You know, not to mention that they said that he is uh, Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14. Nothing too important. Okay, these are strange sounds. Two minutes, all right? Then we'll be out of here. Why? The paradigm of the money. When the, King James, when the King James Bible was first published in 1611, it was under the copyright of the Crown of England. God providentially saw fit for 13 British colonies in the New World to declare independence. How interesting. And, that, and they would lead the way for every other English-speaking nation in the world to ignore British copyrights. Today, the King James Bible is in the public domain. The public domain. It is the people's book. Anybody can print this book, publish this book. Anybody can print this book on any piece of literature, on any video, any music video, anything like that. And they don't have to pay royalties to a publishing company. And they don't have to worry about threats of a lawsuit. Try taking the NIV and uh, doing what we did with the gospel, with the, with the John and Romans project, the Show Me Gospel project. Okay, it would have cost us a fortune. A fortune, all right? What else is there? The derivative copyright law requires a 10% change from what is in the public domain as well as a change from all the other works out there. So pray tell me why we have 400 English Bible translations. It's because everybody wants their Bible to say something different so they can sell it. And excuse me if I don't want to participate in the monetization of God's Word. I get a little heated about that. All right. So where are we at today? Is anyone in here bold enough to say that there are more Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches in America today than 100 years ago? Is anyone in here today bold enough to say that there are more missionaries being sent out today than 100 years ago? Is there anybody in here bold enough to say that the American church is in better shape today than it was 100 years ago? Is there anybody who is willing to say that Christians today have a higher view of Scripture today than they did 100 years ago? No. No, I don't think so. I'm not saying that modern versions have caused this. Okay? But to say there isn't a correlation, I believe, is intellectually dishonest. Correlation does not mean causation. I strongly believe the influx of modern Bibles have aided in this buffet style of Christianity where I get to pick and choose whatever I believe, whatever I feel, whatever I think is best. I strongly believe they have, uh, they have said that. As many of you know, I have been in many... And I'm not trying to flaunt this or brag, but I've been on many Bible studies where we've gone verse by verse at the University of Missouri campus through the book of Acts, through the book of Mark, through the Gospels, and we've gone verse by verse. And I was floored when I was sitting in a room full of six other Christians, and we read verse by verse through Acts chapter 8, and they went from Acts chapter 36 at 8, 836 to 838, and no one flinched. And I was waiting for the teacher to say something. I waited for an hour and no one pointed out the fact that, hey, there's a verse missing. Okay, if I had a dollar for every time I heard, what does your translation of the Bible say? Oh, mine says this. Oh, isn't that nice that we, we have all these translations? Listen, when God said, study to show thyself approved, he didn't mean get out your NIV, your NASB, your ESV, your NKJV, your KJV, your RSV, your ASV, your NLT, your Living Bible, your Good News for Modern Man, and compare all of them and see which one you like best. That is not what he meant. All right, I'm about, I'm, I'm done. All right. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would uh, give us discernment and that you would help us have a high view of your scripture. I pray you would help us to lovingly and kindly and truthfully uh, um, be brothers and sisters in Christ with people that don't have the view we have. Um, and I pray that you might aid us in that.
and that we would cherish your word and love your word, and we thank you for giving us the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen.